Live. And welcome to Relag Live, everybody. I'm your host, Sean Haney. Thanks a lot for tuning in today here on this Friday. This is a great way to finish off the week talking about, a, I think, a super critical topic when it comes to developing uh, agriculture going forward. And I think our, our guest today is going to agree with that. If you want to participate in today's discussion, all you have to do is enter your question or comment in the box, whether you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. We love your participation, and that's what makes this show so unique in the fact that we are live here every single weekday. Let's bring in today's guest. It is, just hold on here, we got Kelly Dobson. He <laughs> is the founder and performance coach with Leadership Inc. Kelly, how are you? I'm well. Like I said, pretty tired. It's, a, it's harvest time here at Leadership in January. We're just uh, going to kick off the National Farm Leadership Program here Monday morning, 8 o'clock. So um, COVID has has deferred everyone's decision to the last minute, and we're excited that you know we got good numbers coming in, but mm. whew, it's been been some long days. What, so, what is, talk about that program for people that don't know. What What is that program? So the National Farm Leadership Program is a partnership program between Leadership, us, and Farm Management Canada. And that's been a sort of an evolving, um, uh, an evolving partnership that started a couple of years ago with myself and Heather Watson. And actually, Heather, uh, I invited her in uh, to, when, when Leadership shifted how we were going to do things. And we started looking at the ag space and saying, you know, how can we make this stuff like really accessible in the best way possible? We realized there was going to have to be some significant changes in, in design and delivery. And so I thought that Heather would, be, would have been a great advisor member. So she was part of the early, uh, she was part of the early group uh, that, that advised on that cohort. And we started working together and then we realized, hey, maybe we should um, work closer, work together. So that became the National Farm Leadership Program. And uh, we bring people in from like our cohort coming up here is we've got people all the way from Ontario, all the way up to Nanus Bay, Vancouver Island. So cool. Uh, we're covering a big swath, a big swath of Canada. So leadership, you just go to chapters. There are shelves of leadership books. Uh, myself at home, my bookshelf full of books on leadership. Th this is a topic that not just you know, people in agribusiness or farmers that own their own businesses, it, the entire business world is constantly in this quest to yeah. sort of, sort of, a, a, find this like increased level of new leadership how, how do we actually define leadership kelly well i think that's the half the problem sean is that um leadership is very popular um i think amazon tops out on a hundred thousand on the book search if you google it it's in the billions of hits um so i'll say this and i say this is half the challenge that i think leadership has and i think everybody who who is very interested in this is that what people don't know is that leadership, and we talked about this before, said, you know, leadership isn't a thing. Well, leadership is a thing. It's studied. We can measure it. It's actually not really soft anymore. It's hard. In other words, we can quantify it. We can qualify it. There now, we've got data on it. We're doing data analytics that are actually trying to sift through what's really happening and what's driving performance. And that's guiding the kinds of training. And that's evolving. Like a lot of people think as much as it's age old and people know it and can see it when when it's in front of them and when they're experiencing it what people don't realize is that there's is that it's a lot of trainable it's very trainable and that part of what we do at the national farm leadership program and i think it exemplifies many people in the cohort is uh there's a lot of untapped potential uh leadership potential in agriculture just isn't had the access to the right kind of training and and people realizing what that might look like for them and so um, so that's a long way of saying that, I'll tell you what, the research says, I think there's uh, 64 no one cited definitions of leadership, also not helpful. So the best one, the best one, and I, I'll, I'll say this one, because I can give you anything you want, frankly, and you know, people could say it's right. So I'll give you this one. Many people, when I speak or when we talk, they go, you know what, Kelly, I, I'm into, I buy everything you're saying. I think what you're, you're dead on, but I'm the only one on my farm or my family that's here. And I don't see how I can make that happen. And I go, well, actually, leadership is pretty much that's the definition of like the fact that you've come out and talked to me that self identifies you as a leader, whether you have positional authority or not. And, and, to, borrow, and to borrow one of the best Colin Powell definitions, leadership is really about taking people down a path that they don't want to go 
to get to a place that they most want to be. Hmm. And that describes, do you think about farms and families and generations and hard choices? Um, that is in fact the process is, is trying to, is to try and lead people trying to, and, I, and I'm not a big fan of the word influence, although at its core, because influence can be done in, with good intent and influence can be done with negative intent, but it's really about partnering with people. And that's our big definition. We use partnership a lot. And, and, and the way we talk about partnership is really trying to get down to um, everyone feeling responsible for the success of whatever it is they're doing together. We don't use it as a legal definition. We talk about contracting and, and, and building and sustaining partnerships at all different levels, internally and externally, to drive towards so people feel responsible. And that's what we find time and again when people are trying to let go, older generation, or they have new employees and they want to give them higher, like greater responsibilities, but they just can't let go because they're afraid of what's going to happen. And in their mind, it's either I'm 100% in control or somehow I'm not in control and they don't see it. And that's, of course, that's on their brain, binary. Yeah. It's either yeah. there's no there's no middle ground. And if they do, they can't see it. It's like, that's, I can't jump that far. If I take that leap, like I know I'm falling into that pit and the farm's just going to fold up like a tent and we're done. And we're like, well, are you open to the possibility that there's, that there's some, there's lots of middle ground in there. Hmm. And when they can see that, not just as some, something you read in a book, but when they can see it for themselves, then that's where that that's where like that's where all the juice is, and so, so that's what we're. That's now, where we're you do a lot of great work, Kelly, in in training and helping, and you know, trying to really move the the people along this pendulum of leadership development. Uh, that yeah. there's that phrase out there in terms of like, oh, he's a boring leader. Are, mm. are, are, is that does that actually exist? Is 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 that possible, or is that just a saying that we throw out there just because it's convenient? Uh, no, there's some truth to it. Um, because there's a couple of things. One, there's temperament and certain kinds of temperaments that we know like personalities, we know pin more to more effective leadership. Um, we also know that a lot of what, uh, what a person's experience is before, let's say the age of 15 years old. And so in other words, their family and the kind of experiences they had create and shape a, a way of showing up in the world, um, that more naturally bring them forward. On the other hand, what I'll also say is that what is the big shift here in the last 20 years is these old definitions of what is natural born leader is actually not, is not showing up as strong in effectiveness as what, as what is needed. And when I talk about uncovering the, you know, the hidden potential, the hidden talent out there, it's showing up in places and spaces that we wouldn't think would normally, we would think as leadership. And yet we know yeah. just by the analytics, it's showing up and that's, and that's the exciting part because it's actually finding in places that maybe we weren't necessarily looking. And, and even so. the greatest of leaders have faults. They're not. They're not perfect. I, I just finished a great book about Winston Churchill, and th there were some things that were going on in Churchill's life that I, I, I'm not sure they're going to show up in your criteria for a for a great leader, well, right? Look at, look at look at Steve Jobs. I mean, everyone wants to think about the Steve Jobs um, on you know the second act of Steve Jobs. Yep. No one wants to. No one spends much time in the front part where you know uh, if you read the biographies, yeah, not so much. And so that's the part where a lot of people don't realize that um, a lot of people have this idyllic um, idea of what a leader is. And, and, and again, I wish I was one of those people. Like I even talk in the course, like this is not if you were just more like me. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, and that's the part. And if you look at my neighbors, they're like, I don't know what that guy actually, you know, what. But I'll tell you this. What we do know is that there, there, that there is a possibility for everybody. And it's not in the ways you think. So in other words, people think of leadership as, as being something that's possessed with positional authority. And what we know is, and the way it works, is that because of the complexity of ag, in other words, we look at how much people need to know, how much information there's out there, how much their opportunity there is, the fact and the size of the businesses, there's not, it's not possible for one person to know it all and to be in the right place to make the right call. And so the question is, well, then what? And the power is that if this can be, if, if, lead, if, if we can have, you know, distributed decision-making authority at different levels related to ability to, you know, to where they are and what they're doing, that that's how you know that a farmer can go away for a weekend or an afternoon, not, you know, the farm doesn't need to shut down, good decisions are going to get made, and they're not going to have to consult a policy manual to know, because they just know when there's a hard decision and there's no right, they go, well, we kind of know how we roll around here and we know what the acceptable is and that's when you know you have true partnership because those things have been clearly expressed even if it's intangible and they just make the right calls 
Yeah, you know what? Um, I, I love you hit on that because it's it's not just about like a lot of times I think people make the mistake of like sort of that Napoleon version of leadership where it's like you know one person telling everybody what to do and if he wasn't there, no one would know how to put their pants on in the morning. Leadership really comes at all levels. Leadership from from top, leadership from the bottom. And I think that's a critical part, and it involves trust. And as as you just mentioned, and boy, you gave a great example of uh, uh, from the farm perspective. Yeah, the great man theory has been blown out. Like that's I think week one of grad school. Yeah, you know, why about great man? And they go, yeah. So yeah, no. Hey, uh, Kelly, I got a question here from Lindsay, um, and it is, uh, what's an example of finding leadership in an unsuspected place? I find it, um, so I'll tell you from the top, and I think it fits right out. Here's an example. Um, when we look at the analytics on these super large databases of leader effectiveness, because this, because leadership is so strongly correlated to, to business results. In other words, that there's an, a very strong positive correlation that when we measure for leadership and we see how well the businesses do, it's very strongly positively correlated. So organizations and, and world-class management firms are laser locked on this because we know that developing and culturing the right talent means money and success. You know, there's a high potential for that. So they're sifting, they're looking for it and talent's a problem. And then, and honestly, admittedly, there's that wackadoodle of, of leadership development programs currently and in the past 20 years that when we actually measure how good they're doing and how results are achieving, not so much. So this is like a thing that people have been trying to solve and trying to get and not having a lot of luck, but yet knowing that they got to find it. So now, because we're putting analytics into this, I'll give you, I'll just give you one example. Women. That's one, that's one flat answer. Here's the thing they'll find in these assessment databases. Uh, the database may consist, let's say roughly 60, 40 men, 40% women. Then they do the, the analytics and go, okay, so let's take the top 20% of that sample group. Who's in that? Funny, but women are showing up about 57% of the time. So it's like, so that's a really strong positive correlation. Like, why is it that women are showing up higher in that high set than what they are in the overall database, right? So then they start sifting again. And they say, so what are they really doing? And so this is where you're finding that a lot of the, the skills that women have possessed um, historically and are there today where they have been the de facto leaders of their families and their units, whether they be the immediate family or in the larger extended families, that those kinds of skills today are the kinds of things that are translating in building relationships. This is developing people, um, um, supporting them, coaching them. Um, you know, I dare, I, dare, I dare say the word that there's there's a little bit of, there's a lot more, there's some more compassion and nurturing so that we're developing partnerships where it's not just what can you do for me, but what are you looking to learn and achieve here and what, you know, and, and what, are you, what are you really looking for and how can I help you get that? Yeah. And that sounds real highfalutin, but I can tell you, if you've got issues with employee retention on your farm, um, wages wages are only going to take you so far. Yeah. Like people are spending a whole bunch of time, and honestly, if it's a, not a fun place to work, people will leave the first opportunity that they think there's something that's slightly greener. Absolutely, um, and one, much of that is just relationships. One of the things that I found very interesting in the presentation you gave at the Ag Excellence Conference, uh, and fantastic job by the way. Was, was talking about comparing leadership development on the farm today to where we were in the 1980s when it came to financial um, skills and developing yeah. those. Can you, can you talk about why you feel so strongly about this? Yeah, so, so the thing, so the, what I've hung my hat on, and no one's actually roasted me for it yet, and I said this at Crop Connect, I think for the first time publicly, is that I think leader effectiveness is going to be as important to ag going forward now and in the future as financial literacy was in the 80s and 90s. And so the reason I feel that is because so much of the challenge today is we're managing much larger organizations. Um, so much of finan uh, financial management is already uh, well available. And what we're realizing is that the gap, and I talked about this in the, in the presentation, we have two wicked Pareto distributions or two wicked 80-20 um, phenomenons going on in ag right now and then they're actually fairly universal the one is one out of five uh, farmers are actually um, planning and doing and have good solid business planning and the and the other is that four out of five farmers are, are reporting high to very high levels of stress and so what and and i hear time and again mostly from the canadian association of farm advisor space and from everybody talking is that you know we need farmers to plan. We need farmers doing transition planning. They're talking about more management policies. And I totally like 
again, I, I had a choice at midlife to go back to school and get an MBA or to go get a graduate degree in leadership. And I made the conscious choice that I don't, I don't need more MBA in my life. Not me, at least I don't. <laughs> and so what I'm realizing is that all of that is absolutely true. But the part that I'm really curious about is so why in the hell are people not adopting it more readily? And what I think is, and what is surfacing is that this is very much a human development issue and that there are certain emotional, certain things that are going on that is driving people to not step into those processes. Part of it's, part of it's just the industry. Like we're, the nature of our business is that we're really good in the now type of leaders, like managers. Like we don't go to the field with one plan, you know, successful people go to the field with five and you get, and you put a day in no matter what happens. That kind of focus and attention um, creates a level of, of, of a way we, we look at the world that doesn't tend to have our heads lift up enough and look over the horizon quite enough. And so that, so that's a, an occupational hazard. It's also part of our core development. We're very much about what, you know, <laughs> unless it's on fire, <laughs> but like that, that's, that, that's core design in all people. But what we're realizing is that there are real reasons why people are not stepping into these higher level, much more complex, wicked, problems where there's like you look for it and you're like, well, I don't want to touch it because there doesn't seem to be a right answer. And there just seems about seven ways that I'm going to make everybody angry. <laughs> yeah. Or I could be set up and being look like I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, well, it isn't about it isn't about right or wrong. It's about are you stepping into it collectively to come up with the best strategy step by step, so, leveraging all the talent that's out there. And that's a that's a learned set of skills. And if, until that actually exists, we're going to keep getting what we get. So, so at the farm level, you talked about measurement and, and quantitative uh, measurement. Yeah. Um, how do I know if I'm getting better? I'm, I'm working at it. I'm taking great courses that you know someone like yourself puts yeah. on. I'm going to some conferences. I'm paying attention, reading the books. But how do I actually know if I'm getting better at this? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I'll answer it this way. Um, in leadership, that's our big problem is, is the value proposition. Like, is this just another tick box thing? I'm going to go or we can actually... Do it. And that's my bigger question. I got the part that's a dirty secret. I don't get a lot of I don't get a lot of fans in the in the ag spaces. But what we know is that you know the level of development as a result of this sort of arm's length of reading of books, attending conferences, um, the actual taking of that knowledge and then integrating it into practice. So it actually does have a positive impact, it's pretty low, like really low. Mm. And so, which is not to say that it's not valuable. It's just unless you're an active learner who's is on a process where you're really good at doing that. A lot of it is just, you know, it's in, I don't want to say it's in the ear and when in the, in one ear and out the other, but it kind of is what we do is that people need, when we take people into the program, the first thing we do is we, is we assess them and we actually measure them. They're their actual leader effectiveness. And we measure that against a global, a global standard. And our partner actually now we can actually select for agriculture as a sector where they're gathering data. So we're able to sort of get, so they kind of figure out, they get a line in the marker about where they are in that. And then the next thing we do is we start, we start helping them over time say, okay, where is this going to put us, you know, or, or put me and, and if I really wanted to be better, just like we set yields and targets, that's what we invite people to do, to put a, put a flag in the sand in December about, and let's quantify what would substantive improvement and how I'm showing up look like. How am I going to get there? How will I know when I get there? And, and when we do that, so we put that level of planning into human development and, they, and it's personal and individualized. And when we do that, what happens is that, so first of all, people know that they got to stretch. So they know they're actually going to have to be working at doing things. It's like saying, I'm going to get in shape, but I just read fitness magazines. <laughs> We're going to have to do a little more than that. Or I'm going to attend fitness conferences. Yeah. Yeah, not so much. So we actually have to practice it. We have to have, to have a practice. We've got to practice the practice. And then what we find in our deal is that when we check in with people and ask them to self-assess, uh, you know, they actually know because we've because we've generated a level of self-awareness. And that's actually, just so you know, that's one of the most, that's about as fundamental as as uh, as gravity, is this idea of self-awareness is, is the crazy positive correlation to leader effectiveness. So those that actually know, know what to look for and know and actually have the skills to go up and ask like they're actually asking for feedback and that they've created a culture inside of their business where people who they know and trust are gonna are, you know will be able to sit them down and go you know i got some concerns or i'm noticing some things that are going well you know really going well and i feel so much better about how you're about how you're showing up or how you're taking us through this mm -hmm. so that feedback exists it's not this culture of silence and 
whatever that they, they establish that, that, that kind of rapport. So that's my long winded answer to you. That's a good one. I, I think it's, it's, it's a fundamental question, this whole process of trying to figure out, okay, am I actually getting better as I'm trying to, to work at this skill? Um, how, how much of it is, is also taking all of what you've been talking about here and find, you know, putting your own stamp on it? It, there's a lot of different leadership styles out there. Some are similar to others, but how much it just comes down to like being yourself as you, as you, you use the word influence, but as, as you are being a leader or trying to be a leader and provide leadership, it's, it's sort of just, you're not trying to be something you're not. Uh, that is a really, really important point, Sean. So I just don't want to underemphasize. I just want to emphasize that a lot. So first of all, one of the things we don't do in leadership is we're not big on when I hear people talk about personal branding and creating images, uh, personas of profile and influence. That's not what we're about. Um, in fact, um, those when we some of those people come through the program, um, some of the assessments they get is a lot like a belt sander. Because when we really get down to the assessment that the sense of sense of self, the facade that the projection of who we're putting out out into the world, into the industry versus with the people who really know us and how we're showing up. There can be just whopping differences and we can measure for that. And that's where we know that there's growth. When we see, when we see someone self-evaluating themselves much higher than how, um, than how the actual people assess them, we know that there's a, there's a real self-awareness. And so the pattern is, is that we know that that's not universal. There'll be aspects that people can't see. Cause this is the problem, right? We have two eyes that look outward. What we don't have is any is really much ability and skill to look inward to actually understand what's what's driving the bus here what's like what's the unconscious thoughts and belief patterns that show that you know that make me show up under pressure and under stress in a certain way hmm. and until i actually get real about that about what what's happening with that and then i actually say you know what i'm going to put both hands on the wheel and i'm going to take this off of auto steer which is our reactive selves and i'm going to take conscious control of myself in real time then that then and and working on that 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 happens more and more that actually drives what you know the notion of i now i know how to show up for me because what we realize is that it's different for everybody those plans and prescriptions show up very different for different people question here from lara uh are financial benchmarking and having employee reviews two-way reviews not just a one-sided performance review a good way to see leadership progress Uh, good question. Financial benchmarking. Um, possibly. I, I think this is um, employer reviews. It depends on how you structure those. Um, they can be. Um, usually employer reviews, it's one way. Um, it, it's, it's seldom that even in the best cultures that employees really feel comfortable to, to really, I mean, you can sort of fish around and go, okay, um, what do you need more of whatever? And you can be reflective on how that might impact how you're showing up. So I would say I, that's a big way, a long way of saying maybe. Um, leadership progress, if you want a way to see leadership progress, is I really do think uh, you need to set some goals for yourself and you need to work towards them and then come up with some criteria. So if there is some criteria that everyone's aware of in terms of some metrics, whether it be about meeting or engagement or support, I mean, that certainly can be checked out through that process, but that would have to be integrated into it. It's possible, I guess, is a short answer. Okay. Uh, so what's getting in the way then, in your opinion, of farmers not planning and managing their farms to the level that is available to them? Like I'm thinking here of like, you know, technology or, you know, having those high levels of expertise when it comes to skills. I think the short answer is most people don't know where to start. Um, I think there's a real, I think the big one here is mindset. Um, we talk about this week one in the program. Um, there's been a lot of research on this idea of mindsets and fixed and growth mindsets. And most, we, we have both of them. And the problem is that many of us don't realize that the real fixed mindset, in other words, this real idea of like, we already seem to, we think we have it all figured out about how, how this leadership thing and this engagement thing works. And they've made up a story that either they can or they can't, or that people can't change, or I've tried this before and it didn't work, or, you know, it sounds good, but you know, it, we're just a small farm. I mean, I've heard pretty much hurt them all. Um, and those are the things that get in the way of actually people realizing that there is, there is a, a, an improved or a, an altered way of showing up and engaging with other people, both internally and externally, 
that can drive better results. And I think that's a, the fundamental part is that most people don't think that this is a movable object and by human design and also by the industry, and by industry, I'm just in agriculture, but broadly, everybody's in the business of selling quick fix solutions. Yeah. And I, and I mean this quite honestly, even the HR people, I mean, they're, they're in the business of selling services where they come in and try and have, and have triangulated conversations so the employees can, can heap all the dirt on their boss about how unhappy they are. And then they can, can transfer the back to the boss and they try and navigate that out as opposed to, uh, how about we just train people to walk across the yard and have a conversation in so real true. time in real time yeah. about what really matters hmm. and, and that, that it's not the super and that's the part it's like well that's not possible and i'm like well I, I, that's the only way i ever know that it works truly yeah that's so true uh question here from heather watching on facebook uh, what an example of that was then and this is now when it comes to pre and post leadership development, what's an example of real noticeable change? Oh, Heather, you're just, you're <laughs> just, you're just slow pitching them. You're just underarm pitching them across the plate. Um, you know, I'll say this, the low hanging fruit that people report probably within, within 90 to 120 days is the first thing they feel is an enormous sense of relief because for the first time they actually can see themselves in the problem. They know actually what they're trying, what they're fighting against, like what they've been rubbing up against. And they actually, and they, you know, it's that thing that they're trying to, you know, it's like trying to run and there's just, there's just oil on the floor. And no matter what you try, you kind of end up where you are. For the first time they can see what it is and they can see that they're actually, it's part of their behavior that's the oil on the floor or the ice on the floor. And so they've, they've got a real plan around that. And so, and so they're actually working it and they can see it. It's almost like getting the frost off the windshield would be another way to look at it. So, and then the second thing is that they're able to start initiating conversations every day and virtually every encounter that are, that are effective and substantial, that are not problem solving only, but are actually all about outcome orientation. Hmm. And this is a super big shift for young staff or farm transition this is when encounters are about, well, we're going to do this or that, or this or that it's about, we need, you know, we're trying to get this done. This is a bigger outcome. This is the outcome we're looking for. And that there's all of these processes and what you're doing right now is part of that process, but this is why it really matters. And they can connect the dots. So it's not just operational, but they can see it as a contribution to inventory quality, cash flow, debt servicing, and, and, and something beyond next season. And they can put that all together about what I do now has future consequences. And that's communicated like in every, in every conversation to every level that matters. That's game changing hmm. to a kid and, and, and to a kid or to, and when I say kid, that could be all the way up to, and including as you had yesterday on Wednesday and I listened, yeah. you know, these so-called young farmers, you know, are, are actually can order off the seniors menu, some of them. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, and on, on Wednesday we had a great discussion with Justin Funk and, and we talked about yeah. decision-making and people being able to let go and like leadership really, really plays a part in that, that whole transition, Kelly, probably, I, I think it's, it's underrated as, as an impact on, on the whole relationship between older and younger generations as they try to work together on the farm. Uh, I'd be happy if it were underrated. I would say it's not, not seen as an actual element at all. And I keep saying this time and again, as I, because I could say I'm on the member of the Canadian Association of Farm Advisors, so I sit in rooms and tables and listen to, ag, you know, ag professional advisor professionals talk about the challenges they have in engaging clients and and disseminating uh, expert advice and services, and I also sit in the other side of the room, training, and I go into my program and I look, work with ag professionals and or with with young farmers and older farmers. Our group, 24 to 50, some is pretty normal. Like we have a full spectrum come into the program and I hear their frustrations and complaints about engaging on the other side. And so what I, and what I keep hammering is that this is a human development issue. This is not about a product or service or a plan or a, I mean, you can't, and this is the part that is so that no one wants that not is that people have fully appreciated. You can't outsource leadership. You can outsource your fields. You can outsource your financial stuff. You can outsource a bunch of stuff, but when, but if you're in control running your farm, you cannot outsource the, the moment to moment interactions that drive and we drive everybody collectively together towards the thing that we're really trying to achieve today, tomorrow and over the next five years. You can't outsource. 
Sorry. For leadership. I love that. Sorry. That- I can just, and it's, and it sucks because with the, for the first time, and I, I cause I'll tell you, here, like, here's my story in this. So January 5th, marks six years before I went to grad school for leadership. And I went, cause it was a bucket list thing. I wanted to go and I, I wanted a graduate degree and, and I had a choice. And I honestly felt like my own leader effectiveness was topping out. Like I was doing stuff down in Ottawa and sharing value chain around the table. And I really felt like the way that I was able to get stuff done around the farm and locally and how that worked down in Ottawa wasn't really, wasn't really the same and it was limiting. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go to grad school. It's going to be cool. It's going to be like pro golf school. I'm going to learn some tips and tricks. I'm already awesome. So this is just going to make me more awesome, you know? And so I'll make the cut and I'll whatever, and I'll make the cut and I'll be there on Sunday. And what I got into is I had absolutely no freaking clue what leadership was or leader effectiveness was. And that um, much of what I was getting as frustration and, and non-performance was actually just my, my inability to connect with other people in a way that actually created partnership. And that was a long climb down, <laughs> long climb down a ladder saying that I had a braced up against to hold the wrong wall, as they say, and then starting off and, and building it back up again. And I mean, the, I mean, it was hard, but the trip was worth it because it's super fun farming right now. Uh, I got a 24 year old uh, female who manages the day to day operations. Um, my son comes in. I'm 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 getting you know my I have family and nephews and people coming into the family business, and I'm I kind of show up and kind of leave and uh, different things and I'm able to do leadership and it's it's made all the difference. But but it's a real start of having to see that you know it's a, it starts with me. It's not something I can buy, lease, rent, contract. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kelly, I'll give you a similar experience. About two years ago, I went to uh, one of Dave Ramsey's big entree leadership uh, conferences he he puts on, yeah. his annual conference. There's you know thousands of entrepreneurs there. Sure. And, you know, challenging the audience, you know, do this, do that, and all these different functional areas, leadership being one of them. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, man, I am crappy at that. Oh, yeah, I do that. And I'm, I was kind of getting, like, you know, your confidence. You're just sort of going lower and lower in your chair. And then they did some things where they asked the audience to participate through polling and through putting their hands up. And you, I realized, you know, there's, I don't know, 6,000 people there, maybe 8,000 people. And how many hands were in the air on some of the, you know, do you do this? And it's like, yeah, kind of, yeah, I do. And you realize you're not alone. There's a lot of people struggling in some of these areas and uh, you're not the only one. Well, that's just it. And I think part of this is the, and I, I taught, alluded to this earlier about the idea of the outward projection of competence. Uh, in other words, some of the, the real, one of the Harvard professors uh, that, that works in adult learning and he'll probably be, he'll go down with the likes of Freud and Young uh, on this idea of adult development. The one of the things we all have to confront is that, and what is the, when I talk about this untapped potential is to try and break through this notion of people stop working their second job harder than their first job. And the second job is convincing everyone around them that they actually know what the hell they're doing and that they got it under control. And the outward notion of protecting and making them out vulnerable and not willing, not willing to, to ask for help or to engage people or to say that, you know, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to actually say, I don't know right away. You can get there eventually, but just to engage a wider, cause they don't know how. And it also just means a real vulnerability and they just, and, and the energy that that takes in trying to convince people like, and I see this all the time. Like I have, I have a tight relationship with my, with my banker and with other people in the industry. And we talk about like, so how much time do you spend trying to work around people who are sitting in your office? who are trying to tell you, that what's on the financial statements actually means something completely different. And they're like, you know, and then they list, yeah, we got a handful of clients that are completely trying or in a grunt are trying to get people to realize that, you know, what you're doing and how you're doing it is getting what you're getting. And they're so busy not wanting to set, step into that. And so the notion of people just being open to this idea of a learning mindset, that it's a growth and it's a practice. And it's, in other words, you got to start where you got to find out where you are. You got to figure out a direction you want to go and then figure out what is a meaningful, what is a meaningful amount of practice and energy and what is that, what is incremental? And this is the other big part. And I spent a lot of time. That's actually the whole one of the foundational parts of the, of the national firm leadership program is the first thing we have to do is stop people measuring growth and development by, by using yardsticks, like using tape measures. Neuroplasticity doesn't measure, like does not move at that speed. We have to measure growth, you know, with, with a micrometer. Mm-hmm. So we got to give people different tools and we got to shape them going. So let's measure improvement. We know about the width of a piece of paper. 
And we talk about this, about people got a four legged table and they find out and they come into the program. And you know, that sometimes when life hits that table really hard, like literally stuff rolls on the floor. And so it's like, okay, well, let's talk, let's find the leg. Let's describe what, what that gap is that makes a real solid foundation of how you show up. And then let's get a plan that can insert a piece of paper underneath that table leg every day. And you add that up over a week and you add it week over months and years. And you know what? Suddenly that table isn't so rocky. And eventually it's eventually it's solid. But if we don't actually think about this in terms of that kind of that kind of notion, and that's about neuroplasticity, that's about how we we can keep ourselves engaged in something that cannot be quick fixed. That's that that's the awesome sauce. And that's actually creates that's what takes, like dare I say, professional coaching and development to put that in. You're not going to find that on a with a, with a 90 feet deep of, of pop psychology books off of Amazon. Yeah. Like, like, I, I, I'm i loving this discussion. I, I want to get to Heather's question here because it reminds me of a book that I cannot remember the title of or the author, but it had to do with the fact that some of the, the historical leaders, the people that we look to as great historical leaders, there's like this like sort of like kind of on the, in the gray area of some of them are a little bit, you know, have they struggle with mental health and there's there's that mm-hmm. side of it heather's mm-hmm. question pharma mental health is a hot topic right now and rightly so have you noticed the connection between mental health and leadership development yes so here's the thing and this is some of the lessons that we're learning as we step into the egg space it is one of the first one of the first things that we gently approach both in, in the intake and as we go through the program is what is their what is their resiliency program for themselves right now, like active and passive and people go, well, what's the difference? And so we broach up at the gain side because what we know is it's really hard to ask to, to get into a training and performance program that increases leader effectiveness if you're just worn out. Hmm. And we see it physically and, and emotionally and, and part of the first awakening for some, like again, everybody's different, but some of the big coconut in the head finally is that they realize that their way of showing up and this shows up and we can measure it, and the leader says it because it's called drivenness. And again, I'm admitted. I, 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 when I took my assessment years ago, I was in the 86th percentile, like in the top 90% in, 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 in drivenness, which is usually considered to be really positive. And it is, it has like a positive 0.03%, but it's in the Nate, but it's in the reactive side because drivenness is not sustainable and it's not scalable. Like in other words, and this is the part people like have a hard time accepting is that how you, what got you here as a 20 and 30 year old, like the techniques of meal skipping 18 hours a day, you know, maybe it's cigarettes, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's whatever your particular deal is that puts you through, um, you know, wicked caffeine consumption levels. Like that was my, that was my, that actually leads you like a long time, like over time it's like that, it, you know, it works when it works, but it's not an actual, that's not an actual plan. That's not a practice. Right. And so what we realize is that they have to upgrade. Like they literally have to upgrade from an internal state going, I can't run my body and get sh- done on adrenaline as my go-to sources and on the emotions that drive that. Like this whole getting stuff done from fear and anger. I mean, wow, what a what a hard way to run a business. And man, so hard on the relationships. And the people talk about this. They talk about all the people that achieved, and then they look at the they look at the wake of relationships they left behind, right? And for the super high performing people, and if you're a, re- uh, a listener to to Jordan Peterson, he'll talk about, you know, these high performing, typically males who are, they're quite happy to consume three divorces and, and God knows what for just to be that person, like to be that top dog. Like those are unbeatable. Just the question is in the 21st century, who really wants to be like that? Like, is that the kind of life I really want? And so what we step in the program is realizing for a lot of people going, and this has been my real learning when we talk about mental health, and it's a real big deal. It's that there is when you think about power stroke and recovery strokes. So if you want to think about a, if you want to think about a, a four cylinder engine or a two stroke engine, everybody's so so bent on the power stroke. Ah, let's execute. Let's get it done. And it gets face it. All the entrepreneurial space, man, they're writing books like that. Top, you know, just endless. You know, this the hundred ways that you're going to just power stroke. Yeah. Almost nobody spends any focus on on the on the actual exhaust and the and the pressure and the recovery stroke they don't so think it or the other metaphor is the rolling of the boat everybody's focused on rolling on the on that leaning in and yet they pay no attention on the on the on the oar going back and then of course as you get older 
that, you know, the oar hits the water and smacks and the boat teeters because nobody's very good at recovery. They don't really prioritize. And, and again, I'm, I may be focusing on a certain group because I'm actually noticing in, this, in the younger crowd, they, I think they've seen their parents. Like I've seen my dad and I'm looking who like, yeah, it's super rock star farmer. You know, he, he was literally, he was literally had like pre-internet in the seventies trading canola, like on Teladon and was a, you know, mental force champion and did race. He did it all, but you know, he could tick all the boxes, you know, first early adopter and all these things that are now commonplace today. And he's got a fake hip and two fake shoulders and sits in a chair. And I think for all of us are going, you know, that's not, that's not, that's not the leader style of leadership that that's going to, that's going to make this farm roll. Going I forward. think if, I think if when you're, when you're talking about taking care of yourself and the recharge, I, I immediately thought of Tom Brady. I think it's a great sport example of some, you know, he goes to like uh, an nth degree that I'm mm -hmm. not sure any athlete goes to, but the proof is there in how he is taking care of his body and his mind in, in very much in comparison to uh, his peers who traditionally don't uh, off the field. And, and look what it's, look what it's kind of brought. It's, it's really complemented, obviously a great skill set. Um, but I think he's a great example of that. So I, the way I put it to farmers, it's like, you know, when you get a new combine, you know, if it's a good one, you know, you get out in the field, you can run her hard. It takes almost no, you know, it takes just a minimal amount of maintenance, but imagine a combine with 1500 separator hours and you run it like hell. And then you stick her in the shed and you pull out at, at harvest time and then are wondering why it just isn't performing the way you think it is. The truth is a lot of a, many, many of us treat ourselves exactly like that and then wonder why we get what we get for performance. Absolutely. We've been talking today to Kelly Dobson. He is founder and performance coach at Leadershift. Hey, Kelly, this has been an exceptionally fun discussion. I have learned a lot. I'm sure our audience did too. We got some great questions from everybody. Thanks a lot for doing this today. I really, really appreciate it. And I look forward to the next time we get a chance to chat. Thank you so much, Sean. Have a good weekend. Okay, everybody, I want to remind you to uh, tune into Real Ag Radio today on Rural Radio 147 on Sirius XM, 430 Eastern. we got a great Real Ag Issues panel talking about the biggest issues of the week as well as a beef market update with Ann Wasco. If you missed any of today's show, I encourage you to go back and listen to the archive, realagriculture.com slash live. The discussion with Kelly was absolutely phenomenal. I'm, just, I'm pumped after hearing some of the stuff that he said. Great, great uh, thoughts from him. Great leadership in our industry. Thanks, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Live. We'll see you again next time.